Hi, good evening and welcome to this World Childless Week webinar. My name is Jodie Day. I'm the founder of Gateway Women and I'm a proud World Childless Week ambassador. And we're going to be looking at challenging the lazy stereotypes of childless women in film and fiction. And we've had a lot of fun preparing for this webinar. And thank you for all of your entries uh, as to your favourite and most hated childless character. We will get on to that later. Now, I just wanted to introduce you to all our amazing guests. Um, on the top left of my screen, I don't know if it's top left of yours, we have Annie Kirby. Annie is a British novelist who lives on the south coast of England with her spouse, two dogs and two cats and works part time as a university researcher. She is the author of The Hollow Sea, the just published paperback version, currently number one in the Amazon charts, which she describes as being about, quote, identity, grief, mother daughter relationships, reconnecting with nature and coming to terms with being childless, not by choice. She wrote it in part because she wanted to create characters who were childless, but not stereotyped as either tragic or evil. So that's just wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we have Christina Archetti another World Childless Week ambassador. She is the Professor of Political Communication and Journalism at the University of Oslo, Norway, and a psychotherapist specialising in the trauma of involuntary childlessness. She is the author of Childlessness in the Age of Communication, Deconstructing Silence, and the founder of the first Norwegian childless organisation, oh dear, Andra Via for Nagen for Permanent Barnlosser. I'm just going to guess that one. Uh, she is currently working on a new book, The Trauma of Infertility, Understanding the Experience of Involuntary Childlessness and My Deep Apologies to Norwegian Speakers. Um, so uh, next up we have Sue Fagalde Lick. And Sue is um, an American author of the memoir and blog Childless by Marriage and most recently, Love or Children When You Can't Have Both, as well as the novels Up Beaver Creek and Seal Rock Sand, both featuring her charming childless heroine, P.D. A third novel in the series is in progress. A journalist, poet, musician, singer, Sue is widowed, childless by relationship and single. And we have Rosalind Scott. Um, Rosalind is a UK-based editor who works in publishing and has experience of working across nonfiction and memoirs. Most recently, she was the development editor for I Always Wanted to Be a Dad, Men Without Children by Robert Nerdon. She also runs the Nomo Book Club, where she reviews books with childless and child-free themes, supports Nomo authors and advocates for Nomo readers. It can be found on Instagram at the Nomo Book Club. And finally, but absolutely not least, uh, my dear old friend, Mariel Whale, another World Childless Week ambassador from the UK. She is a counsellor, teacher and writer. She identifies as queer and neurodiverse, both of which are very important aspects of her identity. Her novel in progress featuring non-binary historical childless characters has been long listed for an award for unpublished fiction and she is also working on another novel. Thank you so much to my panel. You all bring just the most brilliant richness and diversity to this event. I'm so excited. Um, and I'm really looking forward to stopping talking now. I'm going to hand over to Christina Archetti, who is going to share with us a presentation from her work about um, the stereotypes of childlessness in film. Thank you. Take it away, Christina. Yes, so thank you so much. Thank you for the kind introduction and for the invitation. And it's a great honor to be here with uh, all of you. And um, I look forward to our discussion. So I'll start the sharing my screen because I'm going to show you some images. And so that allows me to do that uh, very easily. Yes, I hope it's uh, visible. Okay, so I would like to talk about uh, this uh, research that I've um, the study that I conducted um, some years ago about uh, the film representation of a childless individual uh, on film. And it turns out it's mostly women when we're talking about involuntary childlessness. I just uh, start also my timer so that I don't go on too long. And that's what academics tend to do sometimes. Um, if you're interested in the details uh, of this study, I am going to pop um, some links in the chat so that you can just copy and paste the links and perhaps read in your own time. So I've got uh, a link to where you can read the draft of the full article. Uh, also, there is a link to my book. 
So the e version, uh, child access in the age of communication, the constructing silence, uh, is available on open access electronically. So I also talk about uh, this issue of uh, stereotypes uh, in the book. And uh, there is also a link to a post uh, I submitted this year to World Child this week. So plenty of reading if you're interested. But uh, yeah, let's move on. So um, that's... so the media are uh, like a big mirror that, that reflects uh, society and, uh, and ourselves. And it reflects also the stereotypes. And one domain where stereotypes become really very sharp is film. And uh, in my study, I looked at 50 films from three completely different countries. Um, I'm not getting into what my expectations were, but you can see how these uh, can represent completely different cultures like Italy, the US or Norway. And uh, I also looked at the long term, so over many decades. I was expecting to find some differences, but actually that was not the case. So in short, uh, the stere um, so there were stereotypes uh, and they amounted to more than negative representations of childless, uh, especially women. So it really amounted to stigmatization and in some cases, even demonization. So in a nutshell, what did I find? So I found that uh, the childless women, especially at the end of the movie, when, when childless characters are present, they tend to die either because they kill themselves or they are killed by others. If they survive, it's because they become normal uh, by, uh, by conceiving in some sometimes uh, perhaps in miraculous ways or by adopting, which is always very easy, by the way. And um, yeah, so they tend to be characters that are normally crazy, completely uh, psychopath, and they want to destroy other people's lives, often for no particular reason. It seems like because they are envious somehow of, uh, of others who are happy and they cannot be happy. So the only exception, uh, uh, in movies when uh, a character can live uh, a realized life is if you're a man or perhaps you are a, a superhero. I'm going to show you just one example per category just uh, to give some, uh, some images uh, and some vividness uh, to, to these uh, categories. So a classic example of a childless uh, who gets killed uh, is the, the main character of Fatal Attraction. And so we, um, yeah, we get to know this uh, very charming initially uh, character, female character who uh, turns uh, increasingly deranged uh, during the movie, and uh, she even boils the bunny of the daughter of her love interest. Until at the end of the movie, she turns up in the family bathroom, and uh, there is uh, a confrontation that ends in a fight, and she is eventually killed by the family mother. I was very interested in this example because uh, it turns out the producers had tested uh, on audiences uh, two different endings. In one ending, she would kill herself, um, just for a change. <laughs> in the other ending, she, was, um, she would be killed by the mother. And uh, the audiences, uh, in seeing this second finale, uh, they would actually go, yeah, and, uh, and hear uh, loudly in the, in the cinema hall. So they went for this uh, second option. So moving on to an example of a crazy character, we can look at uh, um, uh, Huntsman Winter's War. So this is, of course, a fictional story. And there are two childless characters. So the first one is uh, Queen Freya. And uh, she, uh, the narrator, tell, tells us uh, that she lost a child. So since she could not raise a child, she would raise an army. Freya turned the once green farmland of the north into a frozen wasteland. There she built her fortress and ruled as the Ice Queen. So in this uh, fictional, um, particularly this, um, yeah, this kind of uh, fantasy movies, we really see the exaggeration of the stereotypes. So, so this is really bringing to the extreme uh, the stereotype of the cold childless woman. So even she's the Ice Queen. So the child in the plot, I'm very sorry for the possible spoilers, is, is actually um, dies in a fire. And it turns out it's her sister Ravenna in gold uh, who uh, caused the fire. 
and later in the movie she confesses i'm sorry i'm sorry i killed your daughter and released the greatest power within you a power you have wasted on nothing but cheap sentiment did you not think i wanted a child did you not think i wanted love but these things were not meant for me i have a higher calling that's what she looks like <laughs> and you can see how she's really the career woman on steroids So when, uh, when the childless uh, keep on living, it's because they become normal. And one example is represented by Corinna and Josh in While We Are Young. Uh, so they spend most of the movie hanging out with a much younger couple than them in their 20s. And uh, so this uh, shows again how the stereotype that the childless, that they are never really fully adult until as uh, the protagonist at the end of the movie, they decide to adopt. So is uh, a life without children possible in movie plots? Well, usually only for men, <laughs> uh, for men and we'll see for superheroes as well. Uh, so men, usually they are, they're quite fine with it. Uh, so one example is uh, Jeff Gambardella, the character in uh, The Great Beauty. So at the beginning of the movie, he seems to have uh, a life crisis. But um, but he still manages to have lots of fun during the story, and he breezes eventually through it. When it comes to women, instead, um, well, we can think, oh, what about Wonder Woman? She's a positive character. Yes, but notice the fact that uh, um, in order to compensate and not having a child, you have to save the world. So nothing less than that. And even su even uh, superheroes have their demons. So I'm thinking here about Natasha, the Black Widow from the Avengers. In uh, uh, the Age of Ultron, at some point she has a conversation with the Hulk. And uh, she tells him, where I was trained, they have a graduation ceremony. They sterilize you. It's efficient. One less thing to worry about. The one thing that might matter more than a mission. Makes everything easier, even killing you still think you are the only monster on the team. So this might seem like a completely harmless uh, dialogue. Of course, it's about uh, a comic, it's about comics, uh, it's fictional. And yet, what are the implications that we are bombarded over and over again? That uh, if you are childless, you, ba you lack even the, basic, <laughs> the basics of humanity. You, you can more easily kill, really? <laughs> And uh, and also, uh, if you're childless, you are effectively a monster. So th this, uh, this is really what this dialogue is saying. So why does this matter? But we, because of what we see on screen is, um, even when it is fictional, is never only fiction. It has consequences. And uh, I'm, I'm inviting you to think about how we have become recently aware of the stereotypes about women more generally in movies. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, in, in some cinemas in Sweden, there is now uh, an, a so-called A rating that applies what is called the Bechtel Wallace test. This was developed uh, a bit uh, as a joke by a cartoonist called uh, um, um, Alison Bechtel <laughs> and her friend Liz Wallace. And they were uh, setting together, putting together a set of criteria that would uh, um, that would make a movie interesting for women. And they said that in the movie, there should be at least two women who talk to each other about something different than a man. So in other words, uh, women should be more than decorations for, for men's stories. So and that's a smart move to actually sensitize, sensitize audiences to the fact that, uh, yeah, these, uh, these representations do matter. But uh, going back to us, so why is it important to become aware of these uh, uh, stereotypes and particularly the stigmatization that is actually there? Well, because uh, how can we expect our voices to be heard and our experiences to be respected and acknowledged when all the majority sees on screen is uh, stigmatizing stereotypes? And what does it do to us when we cannot see anywhere our real experiences represented, let alone a dignified image of ourselves? So on the same spirit of the Bechtel test, I'm suggesting a new test also for us. <laughs> and so to pass it, a film, a novel, 
or a story requires a childless character whose life is not meaningless, who is not trying to acquire a child at all costs, and who dedicates oneself to other activities than ruining other people's lives. And I'm sure the characters you are creating are really along these lines, so I look forward to hearing more about them. Thank you so much. Um, and Vera is a character who's come up uh, a couple of times in, in, in people's lists that they sent in as well. So thank you so much. Just so you know, we're going to have um, a few readings now from our authors. Um, and when we've got to the end of that, we're then going to open up, um, open up for discussion. So any questions you have, put them in the Q&A. Um, I'm sure we won't have any trouble. I will also share the kind of who's come out as the, the most loved and the most hated fictional characters from all of your answers. I had kind of about 250 answers, so lots of information there. And uh, not very academic research, but still interesting, Christina, because it's, you know, it's very, it's, we need to think about this and what's coming up in the chat is really interesting. People saying, you know, from your webinar, kind of from your presentation, when you actually see it up there, it's really shocking <laughs> what, how we're shown. So, um, Annie, would you like to do a reading? Are you reading from the Hollow Sea? I am. Okay. Thank you, Dodie. Um, Yes, so uh, so the character um, here is is a, a woman called Scotty. She's run away from uh, infertility, from her marriage, from another round of IVF. Um, and in this scene, she's in a boat with some people she's only just met, um, and they she's she's on a remote island counting seals. Um, the sea was calm with a faint hypnotic ripple. Tony took us south in his small wooden motorboat, avoiding the rocks that enclosed Luck Harbour, then around a sorry peninsula, a narrow sandbar crowded with lolling seals. Alison took photographs and I made a tally in my notebook so we could cross-reference them later. Such a beautiful day, said Alison, tipping her face up to the sun. Is it your first time here, Scotty? Uh, yes, my first seal count. It's my fifth. I was here the first few times years ago when Ellie was getting started, but I took a break to have my little ones. It's amazing to be back. I mean, I miss my baby so much, but it's lovely just to get a few days of peace when I can have a shower without little hands tugging at the shower curtain, you know? I nodded, but I didn't know and never would. What about you, Tony? Alison tried to draw our taciturn skipper into the conversation. Any kids? Tony's face broke into a crumpled smile. Four, he said, and seven grandons. Best thing I ever done. Are you a fisherman, Tony? I asked him, trying to steer the conversation into neutral waters. He shook his head. When I were a lad, I worked on the trawlers, switched to inshore after I became a family man, run my own sea school, now I'm getting on. Alison snapped a photo of Tony at the helm, making him flinch. How old are your grandchildren, Tony? Five almost grown and two wee lasses, four and seven. Oh, such a lovely age, said Alison. I rehearsed different answers in my head for the question I knew she was about to ask me. I usually answered with, not yet, or a breezy, we're still trying. But that wasn't even close to the truth anymore. If I said, sadly not, would that shut her up? Or, actually, Alison, I'm infertile. What about you, Scotty, she said. Have you got children? In the end, I went with the simplest option. No. The word broke into pieces on my tongue, but Alison didn't even notice. Thank you so much. That's actually really tough. I'm really moved by that. And in the chat, there's an awful lot of people going, yeah, someone's put, oh, yes, the rehearsing in our head. You know, thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much. And that's from Annie's book which is out now in paperback with Penguin called The Hollow Sea. Um, Sue, do you, are you ready to read? Sure, sure. Um, I wanted to add to Christina's pr prediction, how many movies and books I've seen of the single career woman mm. who is so driven she can't even bother to have a family. And then she goes home for some reason and meets a guy and softens up and now she's going to become a family woman it's such a cliche yeah. you know? hallmark cliche i think she usually starts a christmas tree farm with some very hunky kind of earthy country man with a check shirt <laughs> yeah i don't know where they meet these guys because i haven't met them here 
<laughs> Not at all. Um, yeah, my my uh, series of books about uh, up Beaver Creek, which is on the Oregon coast. So we're talking about the the woods, just south of where I live. And uh, PD is is um, widowed, but she's only in her early forties, and they were unable to have children. Mm. And uh, everywhere she goes, people are like, "Do you have kids? Do you have kids?" How many children do you have? You know, she has to deal with that all the time. Um, in this, uh, I'm going to read two very short sections. In this, this one, um, she's talking to her her friend Helen, who has a son, and her husband has become disabled. And uh, yes, what did you do in Portland when you weren't catering? Oh, I was busy. I did a lot with Nathan's school, of course, but I also had this fabric painting hobby passed down from my mom. Paint on silk can be so beautiful when I was learning different styles. I had no idea. Now I have to support my family. Maybe in 20 or 30 years, I can paint again. I picture her in a bright room overlooking the ocean, painting on silk with delicate brushes. Her painting was like my music. Because I have no husband or children, I'm free to keep doing it. Helen, I'm so, she holds up her hand. Don't say sorry again. I know you are, but you don't know how it is when you have a family to take care of. Ouch, but it's true. Thank you, Sue. Um, yes, this section is uh, from uh, the third volume in the series, which is under construction at this point. Oh, I'm so excited for this. I'm so looking forward to it. I'm, I'm, a, big fan. I'm a big fan of this series. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, PD's uh, father has been in the hospital. He'll get over it. But uh, he's been in the hospital and her brother comes up to join her for a bit. And he brings out, he buys some fresh crab off the wharf and uh, brings her champagne and says, you know, sit down. I need to offer a toast and give you some news. You're moving to Oregon? No, I'm a Santa Cruz guy all the way. This is bigger. My stomach is churning. Stop torturing me. What? Well, Sherry and I are going to have a baby. I'm going to be a dad. Oh my God. When? Just before Christmas. Wow. Tears come to my eyes again, and suddenly I can't stop myself from crying. He pulls me close. It's good news, isn't it? I nod. Yes, but all my life I have wanted to be able to say those words, and I never will. I'm going to grow old without children or grandchildren while you're Papa Andy with a whole brood of redheaded descendants. We don't know they'll have red hair. Remember, Sherry is Mocha. That's true, but damn it, I slug him gently in the arm. Why do you get to have kids and I don't? Mm. Superior sperm, I think. Shut up. I cry myself out, take a deep breath and gulp my wine. We need to tell Dad. <laughs> mm. Sue, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And there's also great, great recognition in the chat for, you know, for writing, you know, a, a single childless character as well. Um, I, because I, I think we need, we also need to look at how the representations of childless and child free women when they're also single, it's like there's like a double stigma attached to them. Um, Absolutely. Representations, positive representations of, of single, single childless women at all. Um, and yeah, I mean, goodness, we, we probably need to do a, a whole uh, PhD with Christina to cover this. But uh, thank you yes. so much. Um, I, I, I don't know what's happening in the other countries, but here we've got a whole right wing group that goes on and on about family values and they're starting to ban books and things. And part of it is when you don't have children and you're not married and you're having sex. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that one's going in, quite, going in quite a lot of countries. It's like going, going backwards in time. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, well, thank you. Meryl. Hiya. Hello. Hello. Um, this book that I'm about to read from is currently completely unpublished, so it's not going to be hitting the shelves for a while. Um, but if, if anybody wants to keep in touch with me via social media, you'll find out when it is. Um, and that's Mariel Well Counselling. So keep your eyes open. And it, 
I think this, having listened to um, both Annie and Sue's readings, I feel there are kind of three broad ways to be to be um, childless in a novel. You, you can be on a healing journey, and we can see this beautiful, tender healing journey. Um, it can be an incidental aspect of who you are, but not really to do with the plot, um, but a really still an important aspect of the character. And I think what my characters, um, who are both queer and living in the past, tend to find themselves in the in the third group. It's a really it's a key aspect of their, who they are. And it's perhaps born of the time or the culture in, in which they live. Um, it's not the main thrust of the story, but it's beyond them to really do anything about it. Um, because up until very recently, um, queer people, certainly in the UK, weren't able to have children either through adoption, through fertility treatment. So it's a really unseen and a really important group of childless people. And, um, and I say people deliberately because I'm including non-binary people as well as gay, lesbian, trans and intersex people. Um, and there are, but there, I guess a thing that's come out of that, which is really lovely, and I will get onto my novel in a minute, this is, is the importance of found families. Mm -hmm. And if anyone's read Armistead Malpan, we can see that people, queer people are often neglected and abandoned by their biological families, but they find found families, which are really important. Mm -hmm. And my novels do feature um, found mothers and found children um, mm -hmm. and the queer community banding together to parent and and look after each other, which I think is, yeah. A really important thing. Can track the idea that parenting can only be done by parents. Um, so my book um, is called The Unreal City and in this extract we're in 1930 and Harry, a trans man and a screenplay writer and Helena, his beau, an actor and a playwright are talking of their future and of a symbolic marriage um, which actually did happen in real life. Lesbian superhero Anne Lister had a symbolic marriage in 1834, believe it or not, in York, to her wife, also called Anne. If you've seen Gentleman Jack, you'll know what I'm talking about. So Helena starts off by saying to Harry, well, it's not as if we can have children. No, Harry says. And I know that that's sad. It's very sad. Helena shrugs. Yes and no, she says. I don't know. Sometimes I think I would want a child. Sometimes I think... Sometimes I wonder if it's just one way to happiness. Sometimes I think that I want it because it's what I always thought I needed to do. It's what society tells us we should do. Sometimes I feel there's a need in my heart as well as in my head. It brings happiness, I'm sure, profound happiness even, but it can bring unhappiness as well. I'm not sure my own mother, my own mother was made happy by it. And I don't think it's the only love that matters. I don't think being a parent teaches people how to love. I think we all know how to love from the moment we're born. It's a different kind of love, perhaps, the love of a parent for a child. But it isn't the only kind of love, isn't the only kind of love that matters. I think we would be happy with children, but I also think we can be happy without them. Harry, it's the life I want. It's this life I want, the one we have now. This is real life. I'm not sure there could be one more real. She hears Harry draw in his breath. If you're sure, he says, if you are sure, because I would understand. I am sure, Helena says, her eyes on his. I am completely sure. I want to marry you. Mm. Oh, I got goosebumps, Mary. That's gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you. Lots of love for you in the chat and lots of hearts bubbling over the screen too. Which Thank is you, everyone. Beautiful. Um, so um, I wanted to hand over to, to Rosalind to maybe uh, just to have a little chat about, well, anything you want to really, the Noma Book Club, reflections on the chat, and we have a few questions in the chat, we could do with a few more, so do pop them in there. Um, what do you make of all this and your work, you know, with the Noma Book Club? Um, I guess it's interesting to me to hear these sort of negative representations and the um, the poor representation because my whole focus with the Nomo Book Club is looking for the positives, looking for Nomo authors who are writing about their own experiences, whether that's memoirs or novels, looking for you know the positive characters. So it's it, they are out there. I, I do want to give everyone the hope that it's not all a negative. I think um books like Annie's book are just beautiful representations of speaking from our, our own experience. And I think I would say that's the thing to really 
really polite and kind of focus on. I think if you kind of home towards uh, Nomo writers who are writing about their own experience and kind of have that empathy and they've been through you know, similar things that all of us here have been, you, you can find um, positives ranging from, um, you know, sort of more sort of the lighthearted ends, maybe somebody like Alexandra Potter, who writes really popular books that are, you know, bestsellers, but she's a Nomo writer. She's writing about characters who don't have children all the way to kind of um, something that is more sort of mythological and kind of um, has more folkloric themes like Anne, Annie's work. You can find sort of all across the spectrum positive representation. So I, I do realise that a, a lot of um, historically, a lot of, you know, sort of evil stepmother tropes and so on have been and um, wicked witch tropes have been very you know, laden on and are very heavily represented in fiction. But I think there is now a movement towards us writing our own stories. That's that's definitely a positive. And I was very encouraged because I, I'm wondering how many of these, you know, these fictional characters being created in books by us are making it to the screen. Um, I was very encouraged that Alexandra Potter's, you know, mm. um, book has been turned, uh, you know, into a TV series. I'm a bit nervous that um, because I, I did watch the first series and I know it's been uh, queued up for a second series. The, the character, the main character is quite young um, and has had a miscarriage, but I don't know. In the books, she doesn't end up with a miracle, miracle baby. I really, really hope that the screenwriters don't capitulate to that in the second series and sort of solve her problem, you know, with a miracle baby. I'm going to hold my breath on that one. Um, but I think those, I, I, I love the idea of Christina's, you know, that we need to have, what are we going to, Christina, what's, what's the name for the kind of the Nomo, the Nomo stamp? Um, by the way, Nomo is my word, it means not mother, so it can mean childless or child free. Do we have a name for it? I guess uh, the, the Bechtel test was, uh, was named after the author, but I feel it's a bit grand to call it the Archetti test, but uh, I guess uh, I came up. <laughs> so, yeah. so, maybe maybe I, I, the Archetti I, Nomo I, test, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's really it's really interesting because it, it's very hard to find ourselves represented, you know, positively on, on film. And what was so interesting, and, 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 and Rosalind raised this when we were having a little chat before we started, I mean, what we asked in the registration was, who is your fav favourite fictional childless character and who is your most hated? Now, we didn't say on film. But I would say that 95% of, 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 the, of the answers you gave are characters in films, which really, really speaks to Christina's point about how influential, you know, visual media is on kind of giving, you know, reflecting or not reflecting us back to ourselves. You know, we've, we've all kind of taken it in. It was extraordinary. And I'm, I'm going to sort of let you know uh, what some of the uh, it, it's not particularly scientifically organized this I've just highlighted the ones that seem to appear a lot, but in your favorite fictional childless characters. Um, I'll just tell you one who kind of appears on the most beloved and the most hated list, which is Carrie Bradshaw from sex in the city. Um, a child free rather than childless character who comes up quite a few times is Auntie Mame and also Miss Fryn Fisher. Um, who is a, a detective thing. We have Edna from The Incredibles, there we are, we see, and Wonder Woman are in the most favourites, so to Christina's point about having to be a superhero. We loved Bridget Jones until she got her miracle baby. <laughs> but probably the most favourite characters are Mary Poppins and Miss Marple. Now, I would just like to say that Mary Poppins and Miss Marple are also both single which is really great that they are also our most popular characters and miss marple is not only single and childless she's also a crone so she absolutely i have to say miss marple has been my my uh, my role model for many 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 years I, I think there's an inner old lady in me that's just been waiting to be born um and let me just see and a couple the couple from pixar's up which was it's quite a long time ago now, but it was a, a cartoon created by Pixar that is very that is very popular. So the most hated ones, well, uh, we had them in Christina's presentation. Um, the character Alex, played by Glenn Close in um, in Fatal Attraction, is probably the the most hated one, along with Cruella Deville, 
um, which is uh, the character in Disney's 101 Dalmatians. Um, and Mrs. Mott in the Hand That Rocks the Cradle, um, Snow White's Stepmother, and The Witch in Hansel and Gretel. So interesting how many of them go back to fairy tales or really exaggerated caricature portraits. I mean, let's think Cruella de Vil is rich, single, childless, and she's also a psychopath who eats puppies and turns them into coats. And in the film, she's really, really contrasted with the married, blonde, pretty, sweet, kind, patriarchally, heterosexually, you know, joins every dot you can, homemaking. I think she's even called Mrs. Darling or something, who is the, <laughs> who is the one who, who, who is at home sort of looking after all the puppies and protecting them. I mean, the, the, ca the way Disney sets up those, those stereotypes is just extraordinary. And the way in the film version, of course, they chose Glenn Close. The character from who played the actress from Fatal Attraction to play Cruella de Vil. So uh, thank you to all of you for uh, for sending in your answers and I'll probably when I've got a bit more time do something a little bit more organized with them and maybe put them on a blog for World Childless Week so we can really see them all and comment on them again. Now we have um, we have a question here. Um, it says um, we're talking about portrayals of childless women. Are we really, really meaning all women without children or are there distinct differences in how child free women are portrayed? Seems like there'd be more similarities than differences. I, I wondered who, who would like to speak to that? Just just wave your hand at me and unmute yourself. Who has some thoughts on that? Uh, Sue. It really seems like the child free folks, particularly women, not men, um, are portrayed as selfish and childish and just not fully uh, female, not womanly, mm -hmm. sinners. In some cases, I've been reading some things that they're actually sinning because they won't do that. So it's all very harsh, whereas the child, childless not by choice are to be pitied and to be helped to somehow find their way to motherhood you know it's, it's yeah. what i see yeah yeah I, I would say they're not necessarily treated very well and i also that this it's you know the things that christina saw in her stereotypes and stigmatization is going right up to this current day i mean i don't know how many of you watched the uh, the british tv series sex um sex education it was just about yeah, I mean, it was it, it couldn't have been any more woke without breaking itself. And yet they still managed when they had a kind of an uncomfortable, not very nice headmistress come into the school, who was a kind of an unlikable female character. I mean, luckily, I don't have a drinking game for this, because if there is an unlikable female character in, in a film, I'll be like, that'll be the childless one. And by the end of it, you know, we, we meet her single and childless going through failed fertility treatments. And I was just so disappointed that that the writers of that of that series who were, you know, really painfully modern, quite, quite honestly, sometimes as well, still didn't, didn't see their unconscious bias around that. Annie. Uh, I'm really glad you mentioned sex education, mm -hmm. Jodie. I, I tweeted about that character last year, because um, it was so frustrating because it was so progressive mm -hmm. and so inclusive um, that it, it I just made, I was just so frustrated with what they did with that character. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's not the worst representation of a childish woman I, that I've ever seen, but in the context of how, I don't want to use the word woke because it sounds pejorative, but you know, how progressive, how inclusive they, they tried to be that they mm -hmm. kind of missed, missed it completely with this character. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought I don't think she's in the next series, but at, at the time uh, when I tweeted about it, I said if she if she comes back and she has a redemption arc and becomes a nicer person, which happens quite a lot in that show with characters like Adam, who was the bully in in the first series, had his redemption arc. If that character comes back and has a redemption arc, they'll probably give her a baby. Mm -hmm. um, if she came back and remained horrible nasty person she'd remain childless and I definitely think that there's a binary um with childless not by choice characters whereas if you're if you're nice 
you, you your childlessness is resolved because you get your miracle baby as Christina's pointed out it's like it might be supernatural it might be um an accidental pregnancy it might be science but you'll get your baby and if you're nasty you'll stay childless and you'll be um frosty lonely career obsessed maybe a child stealer or a witch and I I definitely think there's a there's kind of like a binary so I, I half hope they would bring her back because I wanted to see what they did with her but I don't think she I don't think she is in the next series which is a shame but um yeah it was a very very frustrating portrayal very disappointing from sex education because I love that show yeah I I did I was I, I was shocked actually um we got a few positive child free characters coming up in the chat um Samantha Jones from Sex in the City um although I think people found her found her quite shocking but she seemed to be having a great life and a great time and be very comfortable and clear about being child free um and Hannah Wadding Waddingham characters in Ted Lasso is childless not by choice I thought yes it was her, whether she was child free or childless was was ambiguous but perhaps that that gets that gets sorted out but also something coming up about um detective fiction you know we we had Vera in Christina's um at the end her favorite that's a British TV detective that's an older single childless woman I'm seeing maybe the positive portrayals of single childless people are are in detective fiction because we also have Hercule Poirot um, who's another Agatha Christie character who is single and childless. And someone was mentioned killing Eve. Yes, there we have the psychopath whose, whose pleasure in life is, uh, is killing people and she's childless. Christina, you had your hand up. Did you want to chip in? Yeah, I just wanted to say on the point that, that Annie made about if you're, a, if you're a childless and nice, you will get the miracle baby. Yeah. And, you know, I was reflecting on my own experience uh, and this idea that uh, because I'm nice, uh, then, of course, it's going to work out. Uh, and I realized, where does this idea come from? And it actually comes. Uh, so this is the, the impact of the of the movie stories. Uh, so they really shape our expectations. We don't realize that. But uh also this idea never give up uh, don't lose your hope yes because and uh, yeah if you work hard for it you'll get the result yeah these are the hollywood movies plots so that you always get the prize at the end because you worked hard or because you really deserve it at the end that you get uh, you get the result but unfortunately life is not like that so that's where i really realized the impact that movies had had on my expectations really mm -hmm. how i had actually bought into these uh, dreams mm. yeah absolutely and and how it, it kind of seeps into our unconscious from a very young age the pronatalist message and the heteronormative message is very very there you know you know that you will be partnered and you will be partnered with a man and you will have children and it's there very very young in in the fairy tales and the women who deviate from that it doesn't go well for them <laughs> um absolutely and i there was um a guest has asked in in the questions is there a list of childless fiction books at all particularly positive portrayals well, I would point you back. So Rosalind Scott is um, the curator of the Nomo Book Club, which you can find on Instagram, and it's at the Nomo Book Club. And all of the links for everyone on the panel tonight, you can go to the Gateway Women website, um, click on events, and you'll, you'll find the link there, and you'll be able to find everyone's details. Um, and someone mentioned, and this is interesting because Rosalind works in publishing, would it be welcome move to have sensitivity readers around, I presume, around childlessness, as happens often when writing underrepresented characters. Do you think that's something that might happen, Rosalind, in the, in the publishing industry? Uh, uh, sensitivity reviews are definitely something that's coming in. It's usually more for um, people with disabilities or people of colour, but I've never heard about it being done from a childlessness point of view. But yeah, I, I don't see why not. I think if a publisher cared, if the editor felt it was a, a valid issue, yeah, that seems a good idea. Yeah, I mean, considering our numbers, you know, considering we're currently 20% and, and possibly within the next 10 years, we could be 30% of people could be without children. I'm not quite sure how big a minority we need to be before, you know, before just the sheer weight of numbers starts to kind of impact the culture. 
Um, exactly, and I'm really yeah. interested to see how the younger generation, you know, those under the age of 30, who are much, much more aware and vocal and more shame resilient around speaking up around underrepresentation and things might really start to change industries in the culture as they begin to have a voice and influence in them. I like to think that those of us, you know, um, who are older, I mean, I'm nearly 60, um, Sue's, Sue's older than me, but the ones who've been kind of bashing at it for a while, that we might actually have opened the doors a little bit that the next generation may confidently step through and really, really change things. It would be so lovely. We have another question, and I think this sort of relates maybe to film. Why are women surrounded or placed environments where it always seems to always lead to the family question? Yet, if it's a male, it, that doesn't happen. Uh, and I guess, Christina, I'm just wondering, I mean, it's, to be honest, it seems to happen in life as well. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that people always ask men if they have children. I guess uh, the movie plots, they reflect very much our society. And in fact, uh, I find that uh, all the positive examples today of um, positive childless characters, perhaps they're more in TV series rather than films. Mm -hmm. And I think because the movies, sometimes they have uh, this big budget, so they need to make back the money. They need to people to go and watch them. So they seem like to want to go on to the safe story. And the safe story is always very conservative. And... Uh, uh, yeah, so that's why I also find all these negative stereotypes very much uh, in the movie, in the film, like cinema films uh, rather than TV series, where I think that there are some good exceptions. Mm. Yeah, I, I, maybe TV TV production is cheaper as well, so perhaps they can mm. and has a faster turnaround, so they can be more responsive. But I'm do wondering, you know, Barbie. I haven't seen it yet. Um, I feel like I've seen it, <laughs> but I haven't. Um, I mean, this is a film that is absolutely not conservative uh, and has broken, you know, so many box office records. It'd be really interesting to see if that opens the door for more female writers. I mean, what I was seeing was Hollywood was saying is, we need more films based on dolls. I thought, no, you have really missed the plot. You know, no, we need more female written, female acted, female topics, you know, films. Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot of character, there's a lot coming up in the chat. Once again, crime fiction seems to be a place where we're seeing a lot of positive representations of, of women without children, um, which is, I, I hadn't really tweaked that before. Christina. And I say that I reflected about why is that? Mm. And basically because um, the detective needs to be active at all times of the day. So there is also uh, something functional about not having children because, uh, yeah, you don't have to be at home because uh, you normally live on your own and nobody needs uh, you to take care of them. So, yeah, that's why they tend to be childless because, uh, it, yeah, the character needs it. And I'm wondering also if there is something a little bit of the outsider about a detective, you know, a little bit of a voyeur, an outsider, they're looking on society, and maybe the slightly, um, you know, the way that childless female characters are always slightly deviant, maybe that kind of adds to that outs, because most detectives, they usually have a broken relationship behind them, a bit of kind of, usually a bit of alcoholism in the mix, you know, they're not so... I can see how those tropes might might come together um, mm -hmm. to be yeah to sort of lend themselves in in fictional minds. Um, that's I mean my um, I someone uh, wrote me a question saying they remember me saying I wanted to write write a novel that one day would be made into a film that would challenge it all. Uh, still a dream, but I have to say I am nearly finished on that novel, um, and it is about a single childless menopausal woman um and um and the arc of her story is that by the end of the story her novel is not so her story is not solved by either a baby or a man but she has a lot of adventures along the way um and my kind of elevator pitch for it is it's bridget jones meets bewitched meets young so it's a, it's a comic it's a social comedy um uh, with mythology and magic and it's also got quite a deep message in there and um, yeah, I stitched myself up like a kipper, creating such a complex theme, but I hope I can pull it off. And I hope to self-publish that uh, next summer. So yeah, um, thank you for all your support around that over the years. I had no idea writing a novel was so hard. <laughs> I really, really take my hat off 
to those of you who've, who've done it, Anne and Sue, many times. I thought being able to write and having written on, you know, read hundreds and thousands of novels and having already written a book, I thought, yeah, it is so much harder than it looks. <laughs> Yes. So, Sue, um, when will um, the sequel to uh, Seal Rock Sound be, be ready? Because I, I'm, I'm waiting. Probably December or January. Okay. And it's called Between the Bridges. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, I, I, think, I, think, yeah, I think that series would also make a, a great film, a great TV series okay. as well. It, it had a feeling to me, and I, and I hope this isn't a negative thing to you, of a little bit of Virgin River, um, the TV series mm -hmm. Virgin River, mm -hmm. which had an amazingly good portrayal of a woman heartbroken after um, a stillbirth. Um, yes. Which yes. I was, and really, really well done. Um, but there is a redemptive arc in that. And I, the, the, last time I, the last time I saw it was about series four, she was heavily pregnant. So, um, but, uh, yes, she was. And that's the first few series but... really, really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. The, I, you know, I, I think I really, what Muriel was saying about found family. I definitely PD has a lot of that. I mean, she left everything she knew to find a new life, and she has found a new family of friends, and it's very, it's very key yeah. <laughs> to and the I, whole I think story. One of, one of the things I loved about PD, and I think I touched on it when I. It was kind of summing up my three, three, but there's three ways to be childless in a novel. Was that PD? It's it's a big part of her life, but the book isn't about it. Mm -hmm. She's living her life, you know. She's in a band, and I know that's not a not a simple thing. Being in that band, it's pretty complex. There's a lot of complex relationships to negotiate. I mean, bands, you know, are found families in a way. But she's she's living this, you know, she's living this really interesting, complex, difficult life. But it's not about her being childless. It's no. And it's not about her being a widow, although that's really key. Mm. And I, I loved that. I loved that we could just enjoy having a character who's just getting on with her life. And I think that's something we really need to see. You know, childless people are real adults with full lives. We can mourn, but we can still live. Mm -hmm. You know, we can still go to the shops and we're not, you know, we're not, we're not leading terribly pitiful lives. Mm -hmm. PD, I'm Great. someone who's asked who I'm referring. I'm referring to Sue's character in her book, Anastasia. I've just noticed you popped that up in the chat. Um, and I think there's been some other really interesting comments in the chat about how we need a range of diversity in yeah. novels. And somebody put and a, a disabled writer put something about this in the Guardian newspaper in the UK recently. How you know when we walk down the street, we see all sorts of people. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't just see one group of people whereas you wouldn't think that if you read some of the novels and saw some of the films and tv series series that there are mm. you know we need our books to reflect all of us it's been a big part of queer writing um that we need queer characters to reflect to reflect us is how do we know who we are if we don't see ourselves reflected and i feel like childless characters are going to be the next big thing mm. we need to see ourselves reflected and leading good lives as well as difficult lives so that so that it's and if you're a childless person who's out there, you can see yourself in a mirror and it's a good mirror. It's not it's not the evil mirror in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. <laughs> it's a great, we need great mirrors. <laughs> something actually, Annie, something I really loved about your book is also weaving through the way you weave, weave through mythology in it. And I don't want to spoil it for anyone who, who hasn't read it, but there is a strong element of the witch and the archetype of the witch which you then kind of unpack and subvert. It, it's like the novel seems to be going one way with it, and then it changes direction, which as someone who is writing a novel, I just, very clever, <laughs> love what you did there. Um, and I'm just wondering when you were writing it, were you really wanting to do that? Yeah, that was a, a conscious choice on my part that I wanted, um, this character, which is a different character from the one from my reading earlier, this character Thordis is seen by everybody as, as being a witch, she's childless, she's seen as evil, but she's actually, without giving away too many of the plot details, she's actually the most heroic person in the book, mm. and she does something in the book that's so unselfish I can't I don't want to give away what she does but she does something for somebody else that's just so incredibly unselfish 
but that that to me was really important um that um first of all that I had these two childish characters and they were both going to still be childish at the end of the book but also that um they're both quite flawed I wanted them to be quite flawed and quite real um and I had a I had an interesting review um this week about well like, that, that that you know they they found you know one of the characters not really to their taste and that and that's okay because not everybody is always to your taste and I that's I didn't want either of my characters to be angels or devils I wanted them just to be real like we're all flawed and we all have good and bad mm. um but particular in, in particular Thordis with this this belief by other people that she's somehow a witch and she's done mm. harmful witchy horrible things and she's seen that way because she's childless um uh, but to me she is really she's the hero of the book um and I definitely also wanted to use mythology as a way of exploring kind of a bit, bit technical now but kind of the borderline between motherhood and not motherhood um so a couple of times people have described my book as being about motherhood and I was like well, no no it's about childlessness mm -hmm. but actually you can't really have one without the other you know my characters have mothers they have relationships with their mothers they have mothers that they interact with um so I suppose I wanted to use kind of the mythology to tell stories about women because one of there's a there's a mythology mythological story in the book about the blackfish's wife which is about a woman who has seven children and she's ostracized and so I thought that was important too, because fairy tales are pretty mean to women, regardless, actually, it's women who don't conform. Mm. And so being childless is one is what is just one way of not conforming, but actually having seven children out of wedlock is another way of not conforming and, and being punished in, in stories. So I think I wanted to I wanted to try and incorporate that through the through the mythology. Um so that so that, that sort of character thought is who who has has no magic to save herself is on page one she's thought to be a witch but she can't save herself but she is she's the hero definitely she's an amazing amazing character she really stayed with me um cool. after the novel ended and without giving in away any spoilers i know you're on a research trip to italy at the moment which we were talking about yeah. <laughs> um and annie's staying in a particularly glamorous hotel tonight <laughs> and, uh, um does your does your new novel feature childless characters uh, it does. My new novel is a, is based on a real person um, called um, Vittoria a Coromboni, who's um, an Italian noblewoman who was assassinated in 1585. She was child. Mm -hmm. um, her husband's first wife was also assassinated. She was a mother. Um, and the way that those two women are viewed by history is quite different. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to explore that a little bit. Um, it's not it, it's it's not, I guess the childlessness is, in the, is going to be a bit more in the background mm -hmm. in, in this book, but um, it's definitely a feature, a feature of her life. And I was it's interested, interesting to see the, the, the way that two different women who were both assassinated, um, both married to the same person, are just seen so differently in history, um, one much more sympathetically than the other. And you can probably guess which one is seen more sympathetically. Oh, I really can't work that one out. <laughs> Um, well, thank you. Thank you so much um, to uh, my panellists. Thank you to all of the guests here this evening and the fascinating conversation that's been going on in the chat. Um, this, uh, this video will be um, sent out, the recording will be sent out to everyone who registered and it will also be on the World Childless Week website. Um, and I will, with that, I'll also share all the details so that you can follow um, all of the panelists. You can buy their books. Please support your childless authors. Very, very important. And um, Rosalind, there's a lot in the chat about we need a child, we need a childless library. Um, we, we, I, I think, but you know, I would love to see you having like a monthly column somewhere in a newspaper reviewing fiction that is kind of you know childless fiction um if anyone's listening i mean i'm always one another one of jody's ideas if anyone's listening who has a suggestion yeah, I'm definitely definitely up for that yeah, yeah i also I, have a kind of plan bubbling away for a, a childless publishing a mini publishing ooh. company one day that's my my plan so i yeah. think you've got a lot of supporters here already yeah. <laughs> yeah. a sort of like a virago but for childless, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Great, <laughs> yeah, well, definitely, Jodie. Let's talk about it. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. so thank you everyone for being here thank you for being part of world childless week and um, childless in the media day there's lots of amazing stuff on the website about it a lovely article that christina published today um, i published something too about stereotypes and the damage and what they do and um we've got offers for the book covers we've got all kinds of things coming up so this is a conversation that i think we're just starting to have and we need to continue and um, thank you so much to the authors that are dedicating their time to bring that into being. Um, and um, yeah, looking forward to what comes out of this. Thank you very, very much, everyone, for being with us. Thank you.